I think maybe a more charitable way of thinking about the guys who are looking for one last shot is that, you know, they were still doing the thing that mattered most to them in their lives. And they still felt like they had, you know, room for growth, room for improvement. Uh, I'm not saying anything new here to say this about professional athletes, it, but it's a sad fact that maybe we forget because it's in front of us all the time. But it's a strange life these guys lead. I mean, they, they, get, they give their all to this one particular skill and then uh, at a point in their lives when most people are just beginning to take off in their careers, uh, their careers are winding down. Uh, their skills are deteriorating. And I really enjoyed spending time around these guys in their 30s and 40s who were still trying to get better at this thing that had been so important to them for so many years. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, everybody. It's Tim Hanlon, your congenial host here on Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that we like to use as our exploration into what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, if it's your first time here, we welcome you. Hopefully, we will uh, entertain you for a bit. Uh, if you're a return visitor, we thank you, of course, for coming back and telling all your friends to do so as well. Uh, today, a very fun episode, uh, and we do our best to keep them as fun and, and as uh, interesting as possible. Our guest today is uh, author David Whitford and uh, currently a writer for Inc. Magazine and uh, a longtime journalist in both business and sports. Uh, but uh, today we are going back to a book that he wrote uh, in 1990, I believe it was uh, originally published, uh, that is no longer in print. However, uh, you will hear and see why we hopefully can get it back into print. Uh, the book is called Extra Innings, A Season in the Senior League. And the discussion today is going to be around the baseball league that existed from uh, 1989 to 1990, 91-ish or so, about a year or a year and a half, a season and a half, called the Senior Professional Baseball Association, uh, SPBA, or otherwise sort of more colloquially known as the Senior League. Uh, a very interesting experiment in a uh, a senior circuit uh, for pro baseball players. Uh, the, the time, or at least during the uh, the origins of it, uh, ages thirty five and older, um, with a just a who's who of stars, baseball stars from the seventies and eighties, uh, who graced uh, the fields of mostly Florida. Although in the second year, uh, they also uh, had a couple of franchises in San Bernardino and in Sun City, uh, out in Arizona. But I mean, uh, in this conversation with David, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about um, some very memorable players uh, and their journeys, uh, both before and during uh, their uh, their time in the senior professional league. Uh, Wayne Garland, uh, we talk about. We talk about Tim Stoddard, Danny Boone, uh, Earl Weaver, uh, the founder Jim Morley, Kurt Flood, who was the commissioner. Um, you have to remember that uh, in the late '80s, early '90s, uh, when this league was sort of uh, uh, up and running. Um, experimental as it might have been, uh, very uh, star-studded. You had people like Fergie Jenkins and Bill Matlock and Vita Blue and Mickey Rivers, Greg Nettles, Raleigh Fingers. Uh, we talk a little bit about Joaquin Andujar, uh, Bobby Bonds. I mean, Bill Spaceman Lee. I mean, Earl Weaver, the, uh, the uh, as mentioned before, you know, legendary uh, Baltimore Orioles manager uh, managed in the SPBA Senior League. Um, so it's a fascinating conversation, a very interesting league. Uh, that didn't last for too long, but that's what we specialize here on this little podcast. And David Whitford, he says, uh, the author of the book about it called Extra Innings, A Season in the Senior League, uh, is our guest, and we'll talk about it in a couple of seconds. Um, a reminder, of course, that we are, again, sponsored by our friends at Audible. And uh, if you enjoy a good audiobook, and who doesn't these days, uh, the place to give it a try is uh, through our little web URL, and that's called audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, and that is the place where you can enjoy a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of the Audible service. Uh, you can cancel at any time. I think it's an important thing to underline, and uh, it's kind of a no-risk proposition. Uh, at the very least, you're going to get a free uh, audiobook download to enjoy for 30 days uh, on your device. And, um, you know, if you're not hooked, hey, you know, just uh, then cancel it and you're, and you're done. But I suspect that you will find it to be very, very interesting, considering that there are in excess of 180,000 titles to choose from from the Audible service. Uh, in just about every genre that uh, that one can imagine, uh, from nonfiction to fiction and all the various sub variants of fiction uh, out there. They uh, play on just about every device uh, that you can think of as well. 
And uh, it's just an all around good way to kill time uh, when you're traveling or uh, just you're otherwise occupied, uh, but your mind is not. A, a good audiobook is good for the soul. It's good for you. So give it a try. It's audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial of the Audible service. And of course, your free uh, audiobook download. Give it a try. We appreciate it. We get a little scratch for it. And uh, we certainly appreciate Audible for uh, hanging in with us as we uh, get our, our little journey more substantially underway in our uh, pursuit of, uh, of things and teams and leagues and stories around leagues and uh, and people and teams and all that stuff in uh, professional sports that are no longer with us for whatever reason. And a key example of that is our current conversation. David Whitford, the author of Extra Innings, a season in the senior league, that is the Senior Professional Baseball Association from the late 80s, early 90s, coming up right here on the podcast. You know, so far, we're, I think we're up to 29, 30 episodes so far. And I'm, I'm just frankly amazed at how um, how we touch on certain teams and leagues and people and whatnot. And, and uh, while they don't all resonate with everybody all the time, they do resonate with uh, bunches of people in each individual time. And uh, uh-huh. I, sus- I suspect that the Senior Professional Baseball Association... Uh, is absolutely going to be one of those things. And um, I guess maybe we uh, will attempt again to start with uh, perhaps giving our audience a bit of a sense of uh, of how you came across this league. Um, and it, uh, I guess, was a, a job assignment, but maybe you could sort of step back and sort of put a frame around uh, your life at the time and how the SPBA uh, came into your life. Sure. Um First of all, I'm just really glad to uh, have a chance to talk to you about this. It was um, a magical experience, uh, this league, and and my own personal experience being able to write about it. And uh, I'm always happy to talk about it. The Senior Professional Baseball Association, uh, what we all call the Senior League, uh, with uh, small alpha league, uh, came about in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, excuse me, the late 90s. Late 1980s, 89. Uh, I had been, I uh, spent most of the 80s working uh, on staff as a writer for Sport Magazine. I covered all sports, but baseball was my favorite. And uh, I had uh, recently left sport. I'd gone down to Texas to write a book about the football recruiting scandal at SMU. And I was looking for another book project. And I caught wind of this new league that was starting up. Uh, right away that fall in 1989. Uh, it was started by an entrepreneur, a real estate developer, a young guy. I think he was still in his 20s at the time. And his big idea was, look, people love to go to or love to see old timers games, like to see uh, you know, uh, retired players come back and play. And he thought uh, the problem with these old timers games is they only last a few innings. What if we put together a real league? And, you know, we were looking not for the, uh, uh, the decrepit old ball players, but guys, the minimum age uh, in this league was 35. You had to be at least 35 years old and have played in the big leagues. They made a slightly lower cutoff for catchers. And he said, let's bring these guys together, see if we can get enough people, uh, enough uh, former big league players to put together some teams. We'll cite the teams in Florida spring training cities at the time. For instance, the Red Sox were training in Winter Haven, so they make, came up with a team called the Winter Haven Super Sox, and it was made up of a lot of, of a lot of old Red Sox players. And the same thing around the other teams around the league, and put together a three-month season, play in the winter time at the spring training sites, and see what see what we can get going here. And that was the uh, it's an intoxicating idea that I thought, damn, this sounds great. Um, uh, I want to I want to know more about what's going on, and that led to a book contract and uh, three months during the winter of 1989 and 90 in Florida, watching the games and talking to the ball players. So this was a book assignment for you. you this was basically you were essentially being assigned to, I guess what sort of uh, 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 take part in and observe the league uh, in its uh, fledglingness, if that's a word, uh, a- as well as during the season, and I guess uh, opine on. Uh, the people and the process and the fans and just the whole aura of the whole thing. Yeah, it was partly a business story about this guy's entrepreneurial dream, but mainly 
well, and I guess partly also a story about the games. Uh, um, but I didn't make any attempt to be comprehensive in that way. Uh, this was what this came, you know, ended up being was a book of stories, uh, a book of, uh, sort of mini profiles of players that I had been, you know, had grown up following in the uh, 60s and 70s and, and some of which, I, you know, I'd lost track of. And I was amazed when I started looking down the roster and seeing who was going to be involved in this league. You know, Earl Weaver as a manager, uh, Bill Lee. Uh, as a, a player manager by the blue Randy Bass if you remember this guy had a, a great big bat struck out a lot um, became a hero in Japan but he came back and played in this league Joaquin Andahar Bernie Carbo Wayne Garland who signed one of the first I think I think he may have signed the first million dollar contract of anybody in baseball uh, Walt no, no neck Williams Doc Ellis I mean it, it, there were just a lot of great names and at that point I had been you know, I had spent a fair amount of time in major league clubhouses as a reporter and, um, you know, down on the field talking to players. Uh, enough time to know that baseball players have lots of great stories. And the pressure of performing in the big leagues is not conducive to them sharing those stories. And my thought was if I can get down there in this sort of low pressure environment and spend some time with people who had been in the spotlight, but weren't anymore, um, that I might be able to get some good stories out of it and some good profiles. So that was, that was my ambition. So as you got to, uh, uh, meet and greet and see, uh, these, uh, frankly, quite legendary players. I mean, I think anybody who grew up in the, uh, in the seventies and, uh, and eighties, you know, would, would mm-hmm. know these names, a whole bunch of them, hall of famers as well. Um, was there any general sort of coalescence of the types of stories or were they as individual as the people themselves? Well, uh, everybody has their own story, of course. Right. Um, but there were, I think, sort of two, uh, broad categories, um, and, um, of, 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 you know, who was down there and why they were there. And I, maybe if you're interested, I could read a couple of uh, passages from the book. I mean, the simple way to think about it is that there were sad stories and there were happy stories. I think that uh, uh, Jim Morley, who was the founder of this league, the sort of basic miscalculation that he made was, uh, you know, financial miscalculation was that he was going to have to pay players, you know, a fair, you have to pay pay these guys a fair amount of money if they were going to give up whatever they were doing and go down to Florida and play in this league. And what turned out to be the case is that, you know, this was in the days before big league baseball players could count on lucrative pensions. And there were a lot of guys down there who had nothing else going on. And one of the guy, one of the ones who fell into that category uh, was Wayne Garland. As I mentioned before, he was he signed one of the first really big contracts in baseball, although in retrospect, it wasn't that much. I think they called it a million-dollar contract, but it was a million dollars over five years or ten years or something like that. So, um, you know, once it came right down to it, it wasn't that much. You know, it, it certainly didn't turn him into a wealthy man. And by the time the senior league came along, um, he was washed up and he had no money left. And... I watched him pitch a couple of times. He got roughed up. And on one of those occasions, I went and saw him afterwards in the clubhouse and he was in obvious pain. And, you know, his shoulder uh, was a wreck. Um, he had a, a pinch vertebrae at some point. And uh, so I went to talk to his manager, uh, Pat Dobson, and to ask Dobson, why did you pitch him if he was hurting so much? And um, let me just read for a moment here from my conversation with Pat Dobson about Wayne Garland. Please. So I walk into the clubhouse and I say, I ask Pat Dobson, what's wrong with Garland? I asked him. I think he's got bursitis now is what he's got. That can probably hurt as much as the rotator cuff thing. I've been through that. A lot of times I'd end up getting it sleep funny, you know, and get one of those vertebrae pinched in here. Dobson reached back and touched the top of his spine and it cuts off the fluid in your bursa sac and your fucking bones just grind together. He's going to see a chiropractor on Monday. 
Should he have started that game two days ago, I asked. Well, I know he was hurting before, and he's been hurting for quite a while, but he still wanted to pitch. When he does that for you and goes out there, you hope you can let him pitch five innings and get him a win. I would have hated like hell to have him get out of there with no decision or a loss. I was going to bump for one run to try to get him a win. As it turned out, we ended up starting the inning with a double and got a two-out double to score the run and got the lead and won the game, and he got the win. So it really worked out nicely, you know. I realize now that I'd read the situation all wrong. Dobson wasn't using Garland. He was looking out for him. The only part I still didn't understand was what was driving Garland, why pitching still mattered so much to him. I know there's a, there was a lot at stake in the big leagues, I said, but that's over. I'm puzzled why a guy like Wayne Garland still wants to put himself through all the pain and disappointment. Dobson was sitting in a swivel chair. He leaned way back in it now and regarded me blankly through a blue veil of cigarette smoke. He sighed, and then he undertook to explain. Yeah, but not knowing what his financial condition is, how do you know that there's not as much at stake now as there was then? Dobson leaned forward again. That's the point. You see, he doesn't have a job in baseball right now. He doesn't have anything else to do beside what he's doing right now. He can pitch for me anytime he wants to. As long as he wants to go out there, I'm going to let him pitch. He can use his own judgment on whether he thinks he can permanently hurt himself or whatever. But as long as he's capable of pitching, he'll pitch for me anytime. I know what kind of financial condition he's in. I have a pretty good idea what financial condition most of these guys are in. See, a lot of times you may just go an extra mile with a guy and try to get him over the hump. Because I know it's not easy. I've been there myself. But when I got out and had to get into coaching, I was making $15,000 a year. It's not easy. So that situation that Wayne Garland in was typical of what a lot of these guys were in. And that gave things a kind of, I don't know, a tinge of, uh, I don't know, this was real life. It wasn't a game anymore. If it ever was a game for professional baseball players. Um, But in this case, it was not. They were doing what they could to earn a living. Yeah, that story is particularly striking because Garland uh, was released by the Indians in uh, early 1982. And you're talking about a gap of, what, six and a half, seven years from actually playing professional ball to come back uh, despite his health issues. That's right. Um, you know, yeah, a long, uh, a long gap. And, uh, you know, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't one of the most more successful pitchers down there in the league. Um, uh, he was, um, but I think what it came down to is that he really couldn't think about any other way to make a living. How about on the flip side? Uh, you mentioned the positive stories. Um, any of uh, any of those that stick out in your mind from from your uh, your scribe uh, your scribing, if you will, of uh, of the season of nineteen eighty nine? Yeah, um, let me see if I can uh, pull one of these stories out here. Um, you know, I have always uh, been sympathetic to players who um, who keep going. Uh, rather than players who, um, you know, whose, whose ambition is to quit at the top of the game. And uh, I'm just, I thought I had marked this, that story here. Um, maybe we should go on to another question and I'll uh, pull it out when I can find it. Sure. Um uh, And I think it's also helpful for our audience to, uh, uh, to know again, and we'll obviously, uh, we will obviously uh, 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 talk about this on a on a, uh, a regular basis here. But the book is called Extra Innings, A Season in the Senior League. It's by our guest, David Whitford. And, uh, it was published originally by Harper Collins. It is out of print. Uh, but uh, my hope is, uh, obviously, one, you can find it uh, as a used copy uh, on, on lots of different places uh, in our modern Internet world. But perhaps uh, a few listeners out there who are in the publishing space might uh, – might take to the story and maybe uh, think about reissuing it uh, because this is uh, a, this is a whole bunch of stories that are um, really compelling and really interesting and and you hate to lose these to time, uh, especially given uh, all of the uh, major players and uh, and coaches that were part of this experiment back in the in the uh-huh. late '80s, early '90s. Tim, let me. Uh, I, I have located the story that I wanted to uh, to reference here, and, uh, and I think it's appropriate to to tell it now as just sort of a kind of bookend to. Um, uh, the story about Wayne Garland. And this one is about Tim Stoddard. 
um, who um, came down to uh, uh, pitch and had good success um, in the senior league. Uh, he had played as recently as the summer before uh, pitch for the Cleveland Indians, but they let him go at the end of the season. And now he's 36 years old and he's coping with the realization that his career in all likelihood is over. And uh, he runs down to uh, pitch in the senior league to see if he can drum up some interest again. So I asked him, um, you know, why are you doing this? What's your motivation? And uh, it's fun, he said right away. Whoops, wrong answer. Okay, not wrong, incomplete. I mean, you play this game your whole life. It becomes a part of you. It's just the fact that you've been an athlete since you were six or seven years old. You thrive on competition and trying to win. Maybe you could do the same thing, joining a bowling league or a dart league or whatever. But when you specialize in something, it's a lot more fun playing against the guys that have been your competition and your peers the whole time. You accept the fact that you're not what you were when you were 22. I know I'm not going to be as good as I once was. I know I can't throw the ball 95 miles an hour anymore. But I know I sure know how to pitch. And I know these guys know how to hit. Going out there thinking it's a joke. Every day I pitch, even now, I learn more about the game. Last time we were here, I got knocked out. We ended up winning the game. But I think for me, it was the only bad day down here. I was throwing the ball good. I was throwing hard. But it was the way I pitched and the way I let things happen to me out there. I get in ruts sometimes. Go to one pitch that 10 years ago was your main pitch. But now maybe you have to go back to, have to, go to the breaking ball. So you try to learn by that, just like you did when you were 20 years old. To me, Stoddard's attitude about playing in the senior league was the opposite of not wanting to grow up. The point, as I understood him, was not to relive the past. The point was to keep living, growing, learning, developing the craft that had been the object of his interest and devotion ever since he was a child. If the end of an athlete's career was like dying, then to quit while you felt you were still making progress was to commit suicide. Mike Schmidt, who probably retired before his skill was spent, was praised for exiting with dignity and grace. Steve Carlton, who let his talent burn down to the last red ember, was reviled. But which one had more courage? So Stoddard's especially interesting because he was one of the handful of folks that uh, played in the league and actually then went back to Major League Baseball afterwards. Yeah, uh, there were uh, a few in that category who got uh, at least another shot. Um, Wayne Garland, not among them. Uh, Paul Mirabella was a middle reliever who uh, and an occasional starter for the uh, Palm Beach Tropics in the league. Went to camp with the Brewers the following spring, made the team, appeared in 44 games. Ozzie Virgil went back for a little bit. Ron Washington went back for a little bit. Roy Thomas um, went back for a little bit. Uh, Joaquin Andujar went to spring training, got cut uh, before the uh, Expos went north. But, you know, one of the best, (laughs) most intriguing cases down there was uh, a fellow named Dan Boone. Do you you remember Dan Boone? Sure. Go ahead. Tell us, uh, tell us, uh, tell our audience about him. He was not the shortest guy to ever play Major League Baseball, but he was pretty close. I think he claimed to be five, uh, five foot eight. I mean, shortest pitcher. He claimed to be five foot eight. And I think that was a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, he had been, you know, I, I think a regular fastball, uh, breaking ball pitcher when he played in the big leagues. And then he was out for a long time. I think he was installing kitchen flooring when he found out about the senior league. And what he had been doing during the time he was out of baseball was working on a new pitch. And that was a knuckleball. And he had great success in the senior league. He got signed by, uh, Oil scout Bertie Tebbett, Bertie Tebbett's the legendary Bertie Tebbett's at the end of that, uh, of the se- uh, senior league. Uh, Oils assigned him to Rochester, their AAA affiliate, finished the season there. And on September 1st, 1990, eight years after he had last pitched in major leagues, Boone was recalled by the Orioles. He appeared in four games, including his first career major league start, no decision against Cleveland. And after the season, he played winter ball with the Orioles' top prospects in the Dominican Republic. I don't think he made it back the following year um, to the big leagues, but um, what a great uh, story he was and 
uh, had everybody in the league cheering for him, including Bertie Tebbets. Would you say most of the players were, you know, uh, it seems like mo- some of, you know, it, it seems like it kind of divided into half. Like some of them were essentially, you know, looking for the last flicker or ember of, of success or for fame or whatever uh, as their careers were winding down. And some others who were, you know, essentially uh, looking for one last shot, thinking that they had something left in the tank. Um, is that another way to maybe to divide most of the players as they uh, approach the senior league? Yeah, and uh, I think maybe a more charitable way of thinking about the guys who are looking for one last shot is that, you know, they were still doing the thing that mattered most to them in their lives, and they still felt like they had, you know, room for growth, room for improvement. I mean, it's a, I'm not saying anything new here to say this about professional athletes, it, but it's a, it's a, it's a sad fact that. Um, um, that maybe we forget after uh, because it's in front of us all the time. But it's a strange life these guys lead. I mean, they, they get they give their all to this one particular skill, and then uh, at a point in their lives when most people are just beginning to take off in their careers, uh, their careers are are winding down. Uh, their skills are deteriorating, and I really enjoyed spending time around these guys in their 30s and 40s. Um, who were still trying to get better at this thing that had you know, been so important to them for so many years. Well, it's life defining, right? And um, and the interesting, sometimes sad, sometimes happy transition from once that recognition occurs as to then what one then segues to for the quote unquote rest of their lives. And you know, for a lot of a lot of professional athletes, and and we we've scratched a little bit of this in some of our journeys into forgotten teams and leagues and stuff. Um, a lot of folks uh, have a very difficult time with that, and um, you could make the argument that the Senior Professional Baseball Association was, you know, almost like an extension of the inevitable, and it just delayed the sort of uh, reckoning that uh, that some of these players ultimately had to come to uh, about their. Um, you know, the end of their professional careers. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably so. Yeah. You know, there was no, there was, there was maybe only a handful of guys went on from the senior league and got another chance, um, to uh, extend their careers. Maybe some of them went down there thinking that the senior league was going to be a, uh, you know, a regular thing every winter. I mean, certainly that was, uh, the founder's ambition. His hope was that they would put together, a, you know, uh, get, uh, attract a, uh, a, a ba- get a good ba- uh, TV contract and that uh, that would be the sponsorship deals, and uh, it would be the kind of thing that uh, came, came back year after year and provided a, an opportunity for these guys uh, deep into retirement in, in sort of the same way that the uh, um, senior golf tour does for older golfers. Um, but, you know, that, that speaks to another sort of fundamental problem with this league, uh, and that's the quality of play. Um, you know, I think no one really knew how this was going to turn out. If you put these older guys on the field and you had them play every day and you had them play regular nine inning games, how are things going to turn out? I have another short passage here I could read on the quality of play. I think it, it might shed some light on that. Absolutely. It's one of my next questions. Okay. So here's uh, one night where I was out at a game somewhere, I think I was in St. Petersburg. The first inning of the middle game of the series, Lenny Randall, if you remember him, made an acrobatic play at second base. It came when Toby Hara hit a hard shot straight up the middle. The pitcher Milt Wilcox deflected but couldn't handle. The ball skidded to the right side of the infield. Randall, who had broken to his right at the crack of the bat, abruptly changed direction, scooped up the ball, and made a shovel toss to Dave Rasich at first, just in time to catch Hera. It was a sort of play, graceful play, that Major League Second Basemen make all the time. But seeing it made me realize how few like it I'd seen over the last three weeks. There was a lot of speculation about where to put the senior league in the hierarchy of baseball. Was it the equivalent of college ball, triple A? Willie Aikens came to the senior league from the Mexican league, and he thought the two were comparable, with some players good enough to be in the big leagues and others who probably wouldn't make it at any level in pro ball. That said, most of the games, most of the time, looked to me like the real thing. 
Obviously, no one in the senior league could run as fast as Ricky Henderson, but then no one could make the throw from short like Sean Dunstan either. The weaknesses were relative and tended to cancel each other out. The balance of the game was largely preserved. Triples, rare in any league, were a case in point. There's so few speedsters in the senior league, you wouldn't expect to see many triples at all. In fact, But in fact, senior leaguers ended up hitting 154 triples for the season, or 2.5% of all hits, exactly the same percentage as were hit in the major leagues in 1988, and almost the same as in the other years I looked at. Still, defense generally, and infield play in particular, were the areas where players tended to show their age. A hard-hit ball in the senior league jumped off the bat as violently as a hard-hit ball in the big leagues, and when it did, infielders were sometimes slow to react. Baseball is a game of sharp angles, straight lines, until a ball comes skidding through the infield at 50 miles per hour, and then anything can happen, and it takes not only quick reflexes but confidence to stay with the ball and make the play. In the senior league, you saw too many ground balls pass through the wickets, and not enough plays like Randall's at second with mid-course correction and improvised solution. So, you know, I think that is probably what one of the major reasons why this failed as a business is that while it was pretty thrilling for some of the retired people who were in Florida in the wintertime to go out and see players that they remembered seeing in the big leagues, um, the games themselves didn't have the quality of play to hold people's attention night after night. Not enough people anyway. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The 10-Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again... Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Give me a sense of, um, of how you approached this uh, project. Because some of this prose is just is is just absolutely Tremendous and, and captures a lot of uh, and, and by the way, this this book, uh, Extra Innings, you know, is, is just chock full of of this kind of writing and these kinds of stories. And they kind of blend together just sort of brilliantly. Um, give us a sense of how you approach this from a method perspective. Like, uh, did you go to, you know, all the games and all the teams? Did you kind of just like sit with one team and tra- travel with them uh, across? How did you what was the sort of mechanics of how you sort of got all these stories and, and put, all, put all your thoughts together? Well, the season started on uh, Halloween, if I recall. I got down there a day or so after the first game. This whole thing came together very quickly. And it was going to go for the next three months. So, as I said, they were playing in cities that were spread out all uh, around Florida. And uh, uh, I got, uh, went and rented an apartment on Pasigrill Beach outside of uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, there seemed to be a pretty good central location. And 
I made it my business, got a schedule, made it my business to go to the games. Um, I'd, you know, I'd go to at least one game a day. Sometimes I'd go to two. And I think on a couple of occasions, I even made it to three, a couple of afternoon games, and then drove across the state to see a night game. I had tremendous access. There were some local reporters who were covering. There was another guy who was following one team, the St. Pete. Petersburg Pelicans and writing only about them. But basically there weren't a lot of reporters hanging around and the players themselves, you know, this was a low, well, you know, for some of them, it was serious business and the stress was high, but for the most part, it was not the same kind of pressure that they had been facing when they were uh, professional ball players, full-time professional ball players and trying to, uh, hang on in the big leagues. Uh, so they were more open to conversation. And, you know, baseball players are great at telling stories. There's a lot of sitting around. There's plenty of time, you know, to, for a thoughtful conversation, uh, whether they're sitting in the dugout before the game or back in the clubhouse. Um, and ball players are interesting people. They've been all over the world, um, you know, playing in uh, winter leagues and throughout the Caribbean or some of them, a lot of guys in this league had come back from Japan. Um, there are people who uh, for a lot of, for the most part, you know, left home at an early age, devoted themselves entirely to this long shot um, you know, goal. Um, and uh, if you can, you know, so I would wander into the clubhouse or down to the field, and I'd look for people I recognized and try to engage them in conversation. And that's a tough thing to do during a major league season, but um, this you know, was a situation where people open, opened up and, uh, and were all too happy to talk to me. Also, these are people who, who were used to being in, in the spotlight, and uh, I think some of them missed having a reporter come up to them and say, you know, tell me your story. That's a very seductive opening line. And uh, uh, a lot of people uh, are all too happy to uh, engage with you if you ask them to tell you their story. So most of the major markets in Florida, I mean, we talk about St. Petersburg and Orlando, uh, West Palm, um, uh, you know, suburbs of Miami, St. Lucie, uh, some of the uh, uh, training camp uh, facilities. I mean, these are obviously the sort of major ports of call within the state of Florida. Um, were there many beat reporters uh, covering this league on a, on a full-time basis or were you kind of, you know, one of the only sort of persistent, you know, folks out there kind of uh, chronicling what was going on? There were a couple others. Uh, um, a guy named Tom Jones, who still writes for the St. Petersburg times. He was covering uh, uh, the St. Pete team. Um, it's funny. The three uh, uh, beat reporters I remember uh, were Tom Jones, Glenn Miller and Mike Jackson not the Glenn Miller and Michael Jackson um, that you're thinking of, but there they were. That was their name. There was also a guy, Randy Wayne White, uh, who was, I, I spent a fair amount of time with, he was on assignment for Playboy writing about the league. And Randy Wayne White is uh, now a very successful novelist um, and writes uh, mysteries about uh, Sanibel Island. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, I, there were I, I, a Sports Illustrated reporter showed up at one point. I think there was a piece that ran in SI, uh, people, you know, bouncing in and out every now and then. But as far as covering the season, you know, on a, covering the whole thing on a daily basis, it was uh, just a couple of us. How about the fans? Uh, how much of that was part of your uh, your experience, your interviews? Uh, you kind of alluded to it before. They're clearly... We're not a lot of them. I think uh, they're during that first season, the average attendance for the then eight team senior professional baseball association was slightly less than a thousand per game. I have to think that that was below what, um, you know, what uh, the founders uh, were thinking. And I'm just curious as to sort of what the composition of the fans who did come were and um, and their attachment to this. Well, I think, you know, St. Pete had pretty good attendance. Uh, that team was good, and uh, they had a nice ballpark right downtown and, you know, close to a fairly large uh, metropolitan area. Um, some of the other ballparks were, you know, Winter Haven, um, Fort Myers at the time, not so big. Uh, and, uh, you know, it turned out to be a a winter that was unusually cold. I think 
they made a calculation based on averages and then turned out that that winter was uh, the temperatures were below average. I can remember a lot of games going deep into the night and it's about 40 degrees and wind picks up a little bit and that's not really where you want to be sitting out in a at a ballpark watching the game under those conditions. So I think that kept the kept the fans away. You know, it was mostly uh, retirees, which I think was the goal. That was the uh, that was part of the plan, part of the business plan for the senior league is that uh, you know, we're going to draw fans from a group of people who had who knew these guys when they were playing in the big leagues. But really, it turned out that they turned out to be you know quite lonely games. And my focus was you know with the players. You know, sometimes I go down into the stands. Be a situation where a foul ball would you know uh, end up in the stands sometimes and. Uh, instead of everybody rushing for it, you know, you might not bother to get up until the inning was over, and then you just go walk over and pick up the ball. <laughs> um, my focus was uh, on the players themselves, and my memories when I look back now uh, had to do with standing around the batting cage or uh, in the clubhouse. Uh, or the week that I spent uh, traveling with Bill Lee's team, the Winter Haven Super Sox, watched a couple of those games from the dugout. What was Bill Spaceman Lee like? Was he truly, did he live up to his name? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he's, uh, I, I think he may still be playing ball in um, some kind of semi-pro league in uh, northern Vermont. He's a, uh, he was uh, a misfit uh, when he was in the big leagues, and he was a misfit also in the senior league. Uh, I think a lot of his teammates kind of rolled their eyes. Um but Bill really loves baseball with a passion that you know, uh, exceeds, I think, most that of most ball players. I mean, his love of the game, um, I think, allows him to connect and resonate more strongly sometimes with fans than it does with fellow ball players. So besides the players and a couple of the managers that you sort of hinted at, uh, there's a couple of other interesting characters in, in this story, one of whom is Kurt Flood. Um, memorable for his uh, his uh, sizable contribution to how players and, and the league um, work and negotiate with each other. But he was the first and only, I think, commissioner of this league. Any uh, any remembrances of, of Kurt Flood in all of this? Yeah, Kurt Flood, I mean, to uh, Jim Morley's credit, he made Kurt Flood, uh, uh, appointed him as, as, as commissioner, as you say. And I think that that was partly... Uh, a way to sort of signal to uh, p- players, people who might be interested in playing in this league, that this was a serious venture and that uh, one of their own was in charge. Kurt Flood, uh, just to remind people if they've forgotten, is uh, you know, responsible in a large part for the uh, uh, dismantling of the reserve clause in baseball. He was traded from the Cardinals to the Phillies um, and uh, refused to report. And that ended up uh, sort of destroying what was left of, uh, of a quite brilliant career. And I had written about him a few years earlier uh, for Sport Magazine on the occasion of our uh, 40th anniversary issue at Sport Magazine. And uh, this was in the earlier early 80s, mid 80s. And it, he was actually pretty hard to track down back then. This was in the pre-internet days. And when I found him, um, I thought it was kind of a sad story. Um, he, um, a fascinating human being, uh, a very skilled artist, somebody who read widely and had been, you know, at the top of his profession, a World Series hero. And uh, then very suddenly, and um, he was on the outs and Ran out of money. He ended up in Mallorca, Spain, uh, uh, running a bar for a while. Uh, there was an issue with alcoholism, and the senior league was kind was a wonderful thing for him—a chance to get back uh, in the game. He died uh, shortly uh, thereafter. Um, too young. Kurt Flood was, I think, an American hero, and uh, I hope that ball players today appreciate what he did for them. Well, challenging the reserve clause and and all the things that that's led to uh, for professional baseball players and, frankly, just the face of the game, uh, no doubt a debt of gratitude. How do you sort of characterize his role as a commissioner of this league? Was it largely ceremonial or 
did he have sort of an active hand in it? It almost feels like almost a redemption play for him when you think about it. Yeah, I think it was uh, more a, uh, a ceremonial role than anything else. He used to show up at the games and uh, and sign autographs. Um, uh, on you know, he, he, on occasion, he was called upon to um, resolve uh, challenges um, when uh, you know, Earl Weaver uh, was a uh, manager down there, and he he managed down there like he managed in the big leagues, and he was always getting into fights with the uh, umpires and. Um, uh, playing games under protest. So those uh, would go to Kurt Flood for resolution. But it was mainly a ceremonial role. Weaver was one of my favorite guys down there. Um, uh, if you'd like, I could read a, a little passage about a conversation I had with him. Sure. Uh, and for our audience, I mean, I you know, you never know how young or, or old or memories people. So uh, a little bit of uh, a tiny bit of background about who Earl Weaver was before he became part of this uh, senior league would be probably helpful, too. Yeah, he was a longtime manager of the Baltimore Orioles, and uh, um, during the great Oriole teams uh, of the '70s, uh, in particular, and uh, he was famous for uh, his fights with umpires. I mean, it, it, it occurred to me the other day that this new rule that they, uh, in baseball, uh, the replay rule, has basically eliminated you know what used to be such a big part of the game, and that's umpire coming running out of the dugout and getting into a big fight. I mean, the manager running out of the dugout to get into a big fight with the umpire. Now that everything's resolved by instant replay, uh, he's sort of taking that, that thing away. But Weaver was, uh, I don't know if he set the all-time record for getting thrown out of games, but if he didn't, he came close. Well, he certainly was also probably probably the most creative and uh, you know original guy in his uh, abilities to dispute plays and, and issues with umpires over the years, for sure. That's right. You know, kicking kicking dirt onto the <laughs> onto the uh, onto home plate or uh, throwing bases around or whatever he had, whatever he had to do to get people's attention. So I, I went down and saw him. Uh, one of the first conversations I had with him, and during this, we we talked several times over the course of the season. But I'll read here for just a moment. Weaver spent 20 years in the minor leagues, hanging around long past the point when it would have made more sense for him to quit. It wasn't until he finally gave up trying to make it as a second baseman and got into managing that he even progressed beyond double A. In a lot of ways, what with the old parks, the crummy lights, the small crowds, and the cramped dressing rooms, managing in the senior league was like going back to the minor leagues all over again. Main difference being that this time around, Weaver was almost 60 years old. But evidently, Weaver didn't see it that way. Not even the prospect of riding the buses again seemed to worry him. Travel shouldn't be no problem at all, he said. I guess the longest trip is Bradenton at five hours, like a trip from Baltimore to the West Coast, but that's the longest one. The other ones are two and a half hours. The buses have VCRs. You see a movie and you're done. But we got our first long road trip coming up. I call it long. I'll spend two days at home for Thanksgiving, then go to Bradenton, then it's six days, and I'll see how that six-dayer goes. I will tell you this, though. We had one night game on the road already, and that seemed like it was a week long waiting to go to the ballpark. That's the one thing. It's the only thing so far that was distasteful. I asked him, what town were you in? He says, Fort Myers. It don't make no difference what town. I'd rather be in Fort Myers than New York or Chicago or Detroit. Ain't no doubt about that. Thing is, it's a long day. The same old thing. You have to find something to occupy my time on the road. I'll have to find something to occupy my time on the road. That was an interesting insight to me. Um, that to him, you know, I don't know. I guess I never really thought about it that way before. How ball players day after day, night after night, right? And usually it's a night game. You wake up and there's nothing to do except wait around until it's time to go back to the ballpark the next day. And that's the thing that uh, that we were found most distasteful about being back in the senior league: those long days with nothing to occupy his time. Oh, I think that's actually uh, much broader than that. I think uh, anybody uh, involved in the creative arts, right? Comedians and, and musicians and, and, you know, where there's lots of road trips and, and tours and all that kind of stuff. It is, uh, it is, you know, there's a, it is a serious, takes a serious toll on your psyche if you're not prepared uh, to be able to, if you will, distract or, or otherwise engage yourself uh, beyond sort of the moments at hand. And it is a, uh, in many cases, obviously, uh, commingled with perhaps other sort of uh, issues in, in, in personal backgrounds, right? It is uh, it can be a great undoer of 
of one's ability to perform at a, at a high level on a consistent basis. It, it can drive people mad, literally, right? Ask any, any stand-up comedian will probably tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So when um, uh, so let, let's go back to uh, 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 Jim Morley again, because I also kind of want to get to sort of what you saw in the first year and perhaps a little bit of the denouement, uh, which was the second year, obviously not one that you were covering, but I'm sure you kept to, kept following it uh, as uh, as it kind of crept to its demise uh, uh, the year after your uh, your traveling with the league. But um, talk about a little bit about sort of Jim Morley's, I guess, vision. You sort of hinted at it before. And perhaps maybe uh, your uh, interactions with him and perhaps maybe also when you kind of knew or saw the, cra- you know, it was sort of not going to be viable and or how those cracks started to surface uh, during your time there. Well, uh, Jim was a young guy, uh, late 20s, early 30s at the time. Um, his uh, business was real estate. Um his, uh, some of his properties were um, not performing the way he wanted them to, as he described it to me at one point. He was in a little bit of a cash flow crunch, and he had been sitting with his new wife on vacation on a beach in Hawaii reading about uh, the senior tour, senior golf tour. And that's when the idea occurred to him that maybe he could do something with baseball. The whole thing came together very quickly. I mean, a lot of people he talked to you know, thought this was just a great idea. The idea was to, um, you know, generate uh, fan interest um, and at some point get a big uh, television contract. So he was, you know, someone who is by nature optimistic and a promoter and a marketeer. And he kept up uh, a happy face through most of the season, even as things were starting to you know, collapse around him. Um, the first indication was that, you know, attendance was not going to be what he hoped it would be. Uh, that came clear, uh, pretty early. Um, it also, you know, he was in the beginning of the season talking optimistically about having that television contract by the time, uh, you know, before the first season was over. And, uh, after a while it was clear that that wasn't going to happen either. Um, I've already mentioned that he, uh, he realized about halfway through that he probably uh, miscalculated on his business plan. He, need, he did not have to pay players as much as he thought he did uh, to get them to come down there. There were a couple of owners uh, he signed up who were you know, uh, substantial people, people of means. John Henry, for instance, who now owns the Red Sox, was the owner of the uh, team in West Palm Beach. And uh, after the senior league, he, ended up, he bought the uh, Florida Marlins uh, from uh, Wayne Heidsinger and then came up and bought the Red Sox. But there were a couple of people in there who really didn't have the resources to do what they needed to do, including one who um, uh, disappeared mysteriously about three quarters of the way through the season. And it turned out that uh, he was involved in some financial fraud and uh, he was never seen from again. So the rest of the owners had to kick in money to cover payroll for that team. Um, Through it all, Morley did his best to remain optimistic and uh, gave it a shot the second season. Um, In that, uh, for the second season, they kept the healthiest franchises in Florida and they started a couple of other uh, new franchises in Arizona. Arizona maybe is where they should have been all along because I think the Winter weather there is a little better than it is in Florida, uh, but that season uh, they didn't they didn't make it through. They uh, gave up the ghost about halfway through, and that was the end of the senior league. So it's interesting you mentioned television. Uh, and by the way, I, you mentioned uh, Arizona. I think it was in Sun City, uh, the Sun City Rays, and then uh, also uh, I think San Bernardino, which is close enough, right? As obviously a southern sort of uh, uh, oh, yeah. you know, okay. in between LA right. and and Arizona. Uh, but obviously, a, a shell that is six or seven, six teams, I guess, of uh, versus eight the previous season. And obviously, from a travel perspective, right, adding a whole bunch of uh, travel stuff. But it's interesting you mentioned Arizona might have been a better place for it overall, I guess, in hindsight. But you also touched on television, right? Um, now, that to me, that's kind of surprising. And, and it, we, we hear that the the sort of allure and the almost uh, uh, importance from a business uh, model perspective of television. Obviously, that, that's obvious today, of course, in our media-saturated world with so many different outlets looking for 
you know, live sports and, and programming. Um, but I'm actually kind of surprised. I mean, I heard this, I've heard this story many, many times in the seventies with various leagues and things that we've talked about. And, and clearly in the seventies, right. Cable was just still at very much at its infancy, infancy, but you know, the late eighties, early nineties, cable was a pretty established or certainly becoming established thing. And sports was certainly growing. I mean, at ESPN was what, 10 years old at this time. Um, I'm kind of curious as to why perhaps, uh, a television sort of contract, you know, three months in length, right? We're not talking about a season and a huge commitment um, never came about. Do you have any insight as to maybe why that sort of didn't happen? I think that was a shock to uh, Morley as well. Um, it's, and it's not like no games were ever televised. You know, there were a couple. And, uh, you know, I, I think it probably goes back fundamentally to the reason you know, it's related, not unre- it's not unrelated to the reason why they couldn't get people to go out to the games and sit in the stands and watch them. It's just that, um, you know, maybe the concept you know, wasn't quite as thrilling as he thought it would be. Maybe it didn't translate, you know, maybe baseball doesn't translate to um, older players competing as well as golf does, for instance, or even tennis, I suppose. Um, and, uh, you know, old time. It's it, it it's one thing to to you know to go to the ballpark and see somebody uh, participate in an exhibition, a couple of innings exhibition, and uh, get a chance to get somebody's autograph. But to go out to the games, you know, game after game, I, I want to see a good game. And you know, too often uh, the level of play just wasn't up to up, up to standards. It it almost feels to me that uh, that there was almost a a, a bit of a, a lack of I guess promotional flair. Um, because you see how successful, you know, card signings and sports memorabilia shows and all that kind of stuff is. And you mentioned it before, right? A lot of the fans that came out, those that did, you know, it's not just only hopefully to watch a, a fairly good quality game, but let's make, you know, let's be honest, you, you had major names, right? Some many, a bunch of them, mm-hmm. Hall of Famers um, mm-hmm. that were, you know, in their midst. And, and obviously you got to think that from a promotional perspective, whether that could have been you know, a signing after the game or mix and mingle or, you know, a sort of a, a, you know, kind of a fantasy camp kind of thing. I don't know. It just seems, and again, I, I come from a marketing and media background, so perhaps that's my bias, but it just seems almost natural that it could have been, uh, and perhaps maybe could again, you know, but, but with a more professional promotional element to it, marketing element to it, in addition to, I don't want to call it the sideshow, but the, 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 the game on the field itself. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. Um, and, and there were a couple of ideas that you know we used to toss around in the press box uh, um, that uh, maybe they would have tried if they'd had a chance to if they lasted a little bit longer. You know, there were always two roster spots available for. You know, the basic requirement was you had to be 36 years old or 35 years old and have played in the big leagues, but they left two roster spots open uh, for anybody. So they would they held open tryouts, and each team had a couple of guys, you know, who never played big league ball, uh, but were good enough to play in the senior league. But maybe they could have taken that concept one step further. You know, fantasy baseball is a big deal. So uh, uh, why not uh, do a fan contest or something like that and put somebody on the field, let them play an inning left field, whatever, um, and, uh, uh, you know, sit in the dugout during the game. That would be... Uh, I thought that would be pretty cool. Uh, or maybe uh, put them on the bus to let them ride uh, with the players to the game or something like that. Anything to uh, to, to to make that connection uh, uh, more intimate than it uh, than it was. Because that was to me that was the beauty of the league was that uh, as a reporter was that uh, I got a much deeper involvement with the players than than I did when I was covering big league baseball teams. And uh, they probably could have done more uh, on the fans' behalf in that in that regard as well. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not arguing with the pursuit of the purity of the game. Um, I, but it just seems today that, um, well, okay, let me lead into this sort of, sort of near-ending question here. Do you think something like this uh, could exist today? Or do you think this was a truly one-time experiment that uh, will likely never see the, the light of day again? Well, I think uh, the quality of play issues are things that really can't be changed. Um, so um, that may be sort of the Achilles heel of this concept. We're, um, 
I think I think there may be some sports that translate and some that don't. I mean, you wouldn't think of a, a league for retired football players, for instance. Um, uh, a league for retired basketball players. I don't think that works either. These uh, certain these certain certainly these sports um, uh, level of play has gotten so high. Um, the, the skills are so advanced, um, and that we as fans have gotten used to a standard, a kind of quality that. Um, uh, if it's if we don't see that, then then it gets then it's not as interesting. It's kind of boring. So uh, maybe not. You know, this may have been a one-time thing. That's why I guess I'm so uh, uh, you know, grateful that I had a chance to experience it day to day during those three months back in 1989. I think it was um, such a valuable valuable experience. So, David, perhaps you want to, uh, you had some stuff to promote. Uh, I know you're uh, obviously uh, have a, a journalism day, day job that uh, uh, is treating you with very well, but you're also a, 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 a musician. Maybe you want to give us uh, some background as to what you do with during day and night uh, since the time of, of writing this book. <laughs> well, I, there's just a couple of things. Um, you know, this book is out of print. However, um, if anybody wants to buy it, last time I looked on Amazon, you know, there are copies available. There are people selling their used copies. And uh, I'd love to get this book back into print, and maybe if there's some activity, uh, people buying uh, those used copies, which can be had for very cheap, um, then uh, that might uh, uh, create some interest and uh, get this thing back in print. That's exactly what happened with my first book, uh, which is available. Uh, it's called A Payroll to Meet, a story, uh, a tale of uh, greed, corruption, and football at SMU. And it's about the football recruiting scandal during the Pony Express years in the 80s. Uh, Eric Dickerson, Greg James, uh, Ron Myers was a coach, and uh, if you remember, they received uh, a death penalty as a result of you know egregious repeated violations of recruiting rules. That book was out of print for 20 years, and then it got uh, it became the subject of a 30 for 30 ESPN documentary, which uh, replays often. Um, if if anyone's curious, I'm sure they can find it, and uh, uh, that book is now available. Uh, reprinted by University of Nebraska Press and available on Amazon. Um, and uh, the band stuff, <laughs> I play fiddle in a, in a uh, Americana band. Um, and if anybody's um, uh, curious, uh, uh, they can search for The Social Number 11. And uh, if they're ever in the Boston area, uh, we'd love to have them come out to a show and uh, come say hi and tell me that they found out about it on uh, Tim Hanlon's uh, podcast. What's the, well, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get a cut of the gate too. Uh, what, <laughs> give, give our audience a bit of a, a, a bit of uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of music uh, you play and specialize in. Well, uh, we, it's, uh, we call it, call it Americana music. Uh, it's roots music. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe alt country, uh, um, uh, I play fiddle. We have uh, uh, guitars, dobro, uh, bass player, mandolin, accordion. Um, it's um, good old uh, American traditional rootsy country music. That sounds like fun and a great soundtrack, I guess, to uh, to life itself. Um, and and your day job, we can see you and read you where. I uh, am a uh, writer for Inc. Magazine, um, I-N-C, not I-N-K. That's a different magazine altogether. Um, but Inc. writes, my Inc. writes about uh, small business and entrepreneurs. So i um, got a story um, in the current issue. I think the issue that's on the stands now is our annual Inc. 500 issue, which is a list of the 500 fastest growing private companies in America. And I happen to write the story about the number one company this year. It's a company called Skills, S-K-I-L-L-Z. And they are a platform for uh, this burgeoning world of esports. And uh, they publish mobile games that people can compete against one another in for uh, cash prizes. And they've been a huge success. They're the fastest growing private company in America. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm uh, my uh, my day job is in the uh, media and technology and advertising space, and uh, I want to say maybe about 200 of those companies have uh, felt it uh, important enough to uh, either email me or publish on social media that they made that list. So uh, clearly, <laughs> that list is uh, is a very buzzworthy and uh, 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 accolade for a lot of companies that are fledgling and 
uh, and not just in in digital media, but uh, in all kinds of things. So, um, so keep an eye out for that. So, uh, Mr. Whitford, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending time with us, and uh, again being dragged back into uh, your late '80s, early '90s experience with the uh, Senior Professional Baseball Association. I, you know, uh, I am amazed at at the types of folks that uh, listen to the show. Um, I am uh, increasingly less amazed because it's just overwhelming the passions that uh, we somehow touch upon or unearth. And I, I can't think that we won't scratch the backs of uh, a few of folks who remember this league and maybe perhaps influentially could um, uh, have some kind of role in helping get this book back into print. The The stories in it are are just great. It's it's rich. Every page is full of uh, stories and, and great quotes. I mean, you heard a few excerpts from from David on our on our podcast here, but it's called Extra Innings a season in the senior league. And, um, it is, uh, it's a treasure. It's a great book. Um, I've had it on my bookshelf for, for many years. Um, and I, uh, I highly encourage you to seek it out and let's, uh, let's hope perhaps we can generate some heat to maybe get it reissued for others to enjoy on a, bro- on a uh, broad, broader basis. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and, uh, I look forward to staying in touch for hopefully some more conversations and, and maybe we can get something going again with this book. Oh, thank you, Tim. You're very kind, and I uh, enjoyed being on your uh, podcast, and I really uh, admire what you're doing, and hope you get to keep doing it for a long time to come. Thank you for having me. All right, there it is. Thank you to David Whitford for a very interesting discussion about the old Senior League, the Senior Professional Baseball Association, the book uh, that we uh, uh, referenced uh, that David wrote and uh, was published in 1991 is called Extra Innings, A Season in the Senior League. It is uh, published by Edward Burlingame Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. Uh, as we said on the uh, during our interview, the book is out of print. So the place that you can best find that is uh, wherever you can find used books, whether that be uh, places like Powell's Books or uh, the uh, used book uh, environments of places like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, etc. Uh, we'll have a link to some of the better places to find that uh, on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. Of course, uh, just look for the episode uh, featuring David Whitford, uh, episode number 30, and uh, you will uh, be able, able to find some links there. We, of course, are on a mission uh, to get this book back into print uh, they're just some, some great stories, and uh, 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 you know it's 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 an amazing uh, little snapshot into uh, the history of professional baseball that we don't want to lose. So uh, anybody in the publishing industry uh, listening to the show and want to uh, talk about how we can maybe uh, mutually get that underway, please by all means reach out. You can go to our website and find our email link there. Uh, you can hit us up on uh, social media at Good Seats Still Available uh, on uh, Instagram. You can find us on Twitter at Good Seats Still. Uh, is the handle there. you find a uh, page to us devoted uh, to us on uh, Facebook. You can hit us up there. Uh, or as we said, email on our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, a couple of other promo things. Uh, David mentioned uh, his previous book, which is been, has been, yes, uh, reissued uh, uh, on University of Nebraska Press called Payroll to Meet. That's the sort of story of the SMU football team and its travails uh, post-blacklisting uh, from the NCAA. Uh, that is available in print. Uh, David's writings uh, during his day job uh, for Inc. Magazine can be found at Inc.com and uh, two Twitter feeds to follow David uh, in his other journeys in life. One is uh, at David Whitford, W-H-I-T-F-O-R-D, and the uh, musical group, The Social Number 11, that he is part of up in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, you can follow uh, him on uh, and them on Twitter at the social n o eleven, uh, as well as their website the social n o eleven dot com, and uh, the group is called the Social Number Eleven, and uh, you can find them touring up in New England uh, as well. Uh, our thanks to David. Our thanks to you for listening. Uh, we appreciate it tremendously. We will get some shout outs to you. We we promise. Uh, in the weeks to come, uh, we just need to collate all of our input, and uh, we just we're just so overwhelmed by your uh, your your thoughts and your uh, your uh, reactions to the show, your suggestions, of course, and we've got a whole bunch of stuff stacked up and ready to go for future episodes. So please keep listening. Please tell your friends. Please rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you can rate and review. That helps us get some heat. And um, uh, just you know, uh, unbounded thanks. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon on our next episode of Good Seats Still Available. Thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.